You're listening to The Big Album Show with Paul Dillon and Dan O'Neill. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of The Big Album Show. I'm Dan. And I'm Paul. Today we're talking about the score by the Fugees, a.k.a. Lauren Hill, Wyclef Jean and Praz Michel. The score is the second and final studio album by the group. It was released on February 13th, 1996 on Columbia Records, and it was a massive hit here in Ireland with one of its big singles, Ready or Not, topping the charts for eight solid weeks. With 22 million copies sold worldwide, the album has become one of the best-selling albums of all time and is one of the best-selling albums ever released by a hip-hop group. It did, however, cause somewhat of a moral panic in Ireland, with critics pointing to the bad language contained in the album, rumours about the band's supposedly controversial views, and the group being banned from the Point Depot. Paul, what do you remember about this big album? Dan, you're bringing me right back to 1996. I was, I was, uh, oh, I was, I was 13 when the album came out. I remember it really, really clearly and really, really well. Uh, we're going right back into the 90s here, Dan, aren't we? It's just, uh, you know, it, it, th- this album was to 90s music, what, you know, what T-Rex was, to Dinosaurs. I mean, as you said, 22 million copies sold. Biggest hip hop record of all time, Dan, I think I'm correct in saying. Yeah. Um, and just made massive stars of uh, Lauren Hill, Wycliffe and Praz. Um, and if you're from the 90s, uh, you know, Planet 90s, <laughs> I suppose you'll just remember how massive the album was. Um and, you know, I remember it really clearly coming out. Um, I remember the first single off it, um, which, of course, was Fuji La, which is a kind of a funny sort of uh, offbeat kind of tune. Um, and, of course, we all remember uh, the singles uh, as they rolled on. Um, and you mentioned there, uh, you know, Ready or Not, of course, which was the sec- second single, uh, kind of, no, sorry, third single and quite controversial. Uh, no Woman Will Cry, of course, the fourth single. Not so controversial, but lovely stories behind it. Um, and, you know, just you just remember them at the time and just how big they were, Dan. Absolutely massive. They strode, all, they, they, they just dominated the mu- Irish music scene back in 1996. <laughs> no question about it. I remember the year well. It was the year of my first Holy Communion and I got enough money. I was very lucky. I got to buy a Super Nintendo. It, <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> no, but just to, just to remind people of 1996. So let's 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 contextualize it for people. So you had the, the bombing of Canary Wharf. You had the, 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 the sad death of uh, well, the murder of Veronica Guerin. You had the release of Michael Collins classic movie. Um, mm. The last Magdalene Laundry in Ireland closed down. Divorce mm. became legal after the 1995 referendum. And uh, classic take song. Take that split up, Dan. Don't forget take that. Take that split that. up. You had Ain Fuckle Ella in the yeah, charts that, along that with... was the second biggest single of the year <laughs> was it yeah Jeez, yes and 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 um our, you know there's also two boys on singles number one in Ireland that year well wow. uh, father and son and words um, and who can forget what what oasis song was in the charts can you remember don't look back in anger was it definitely hit number one in 1996 yeah. uh, for oasis am i right yeah you're, give you're, that man yes give that right. man a can of coke <laughs> <laughs> no i definitely don't want coke <laughs> Um, yeah, and there was a weird song as well, Man, U- Man United Man, but Man United Man it was called. By Man United. Band, yeah, by Man United. And yeah. the lyrics went, Sir Matt Busby is me cat and Bestie is me dog or, or vice versa. And I remember I got a dog that year and believe it or not, I called him Busby after Sir Matt Busby. Um, so inspired by uh, Man United to do that. So uh, they did have an influence <laughs> in my life anyway. They cast a shadow, Dan. They cast a shadow. <laughs> Dan, can I can I cast uh, ourselves back to uh, maybe our personal memories uh, of of the time, right? Mm. And I'll tell you what I remember about the Fujis and those singles that I mentioned uh, in particular. It's just how massive they were on Irish radio, and um, they were absolutely they were absolutely huge. Uh, Killing me softly, you mentioned No Woman or Cry, Fuji La, uh, and they, they dominated the Irish radio scene that year. And of course, radio in the mid 90s and right throughout the 90s and w- was huge. I mean, in the way that podcasts like our own now define uh, the music agenda in those days, very, very much radio play was where it's at, wasn't it, Dan? It was. Um, it, it can't be stressed enough. I think every school kid was talking about the Fugees. 
was yeah. where, where, where I, like I, I remember getting the tape I picked it up in Blackrock Market and brought it home and there was something it felt as a young kid and um, buying I would have been about 10 or 11 at the time it, it felt almost kind of subversive buying it because now hip hop is such a massive thing in Ireland like it's probably the most listened to genre but in 1996 it wasn't necessarily the case that hip hop was as listened to as it is now. And this album really broke hip hop from something that was there, but and a few people listened to, but this put it front and center into the mainstream. Yeah, and it wasn't long afterwards that, that Bono would famously sing uh, the last of the rock stars when hip hop drove the big cars um, <laughs> at the time when you at the time when you media was the big idea. I mean, it, it, you're absolutely right, Dan. It wasn't the first massive hip hop album, mm. um, but it, it was the it was the biggest, uh, I think, the biggest hip hop record of all time, uh, and was huge in '96 and definitely felt somewhat subversive. Um, I remember the the huge amount of radio play uh, that it got. Um, mm -hmm. in, th in, that, in that period of time, Dave Fallon, of course, Tony Fenton, shows like that really drove the kind of music agenda. And you remember then people used to send them in tapes. Unsigned bands would send in tapes to the radio to try and get them played. And mm -hmm. failing getting played on the radio, you'd send them into hot press and hopefully they'd do a review. Uh, but the big, the, big, um, the big record companies would break albums or make albums, I suppose you'd say, um, and they'd also break them, of course, but they'd make them by, you know, getting them, getting them onto the, the radio play. And I have a very, very specific memory, particularly of Killing Me Softly. And for me, one of the things about this album is, I don't know, Dan, how you feel about this. Just, mm. you know, when you listen to it, the songs can be quite like, they're, they're very, like, they can be quite like lullabies at times. And incredibly uh, melodic um, and I said it on Twitter there during the week. I, I genuinely think that Lauren Hill is one of the most talented vocalists yeah. who ever walked into the recording booth because her voice, like she's a, a fantastic rapper and so are the two guys and, and Praz is a, a, a fantastic producer. But Lauren Hill's voice when she sings um, and particularly the melodies she selected for, for this album, it just, it, it, it touches the soul in a way that you know very few other um pop albums of that period um did you know inclined to agree dan uh, i remember in the summer of 1996 i was I had a job picking strawberries right mm. and i mean this is the kind of job that unless you've done it uh You've no idea what it's like. <laughs> uh, I, you, you, to, to pick strawberries, right? You have to lie down on your belly and crawl like a goddamn snake, right? Mm. And it's literally in a trench, so it's like a war. Uh, and on the hot days, remember, you, you when, when you're picking strawberries, the, the the ground is hot beneath you. If it rains, then it's soggy uh, and wet, and there's just you know the mud and the water. And you know, picking strawberries is is is, is not for the faint. Hearted. But I remember that summer I was doing that job um, and I used to go back there and back in this minibus um, and the songs would invariably be played on the radio, particularly Killing Me Softly. And then the emotion that's there in that voice, can it be equaled? Can it be paralleled? I mean, it's got to there. It, it is some of the finest vocals that have ever been put on record. I think it's fair to say. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, Lauren Hill she she was a kind of a born singer there's a, a video on youtube that you can go back and have a look at and it's her at uh, 14 singing at a thing that they have in america it's called amateur night at the apollo people might have heard of it because in the past groups like the jackson five and other massive groups took part in this show but lauren hill took part in it at age 14 and um, one of the the kind of um traditions of the show is that the audience give the performers quite a hard time and uh, Lauren goes on stage starts singing wonderfully but the crowd start booing at her mm. but at age 14 she stands there she kind of picks up the the song she 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 runs with it she 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 you know blesses it with that Lauren Hill uh, magic and yeah. by the end of the performance she has the crowd eating out of her hands and that's at age 14 and then bring it a few years later. Of course, you know, Lauren Hill 
she didn't come into the limelight in Ireland for the first time via um, this album because she was in Sister Act 2 yes, in 1993. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. a, a, a deadly film, like a, a great family film. Do, do you remember that film, Paul? Remember it well, Dan. Absolutely. And and her, her, her vocals, like a, a incredible performance by Lauren Hill in that film. And, um, you know, the, the, you can't underestimate the power of that movie as well because for instance it was uh, the sister act films that launched helped launch all the gospel choirs around ireland that now exist before before point. sister act those yeah, choirs didn't exist in ireland and um, so it was lauren hill's vocals that inspired a whole generation of, of singers right across the globe yeah no it's a, it's a really really good point Dan, and i mean there's absolutely no doubt i mean this is a i i hadn't factored into my thinking the influence on on gospel bands up and down the country Mm. Uh, but there's no doubt on, on on hip hop and on the mainstream music scene, uh, the score was a hugely influential record. I think Lauren Hill was 21 when the score came out, um, and you know it, she of course followed it up. Obviously, the story of the Fugees after this album, um, it, the, the road it, it, things, things change a little bit, and the band you know they no longer record, and 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 there's various. Uh, intrigue and controversies about them but of course she went on to make that record the misseduction of lauren hill which oh. was absolutely huge i think that was 1998 if memory serves and that has to be um, one of my favorite albums ever yeah i mean and, and and i think you know the quality of the vocal i mean i remember listening to uh killing me softly and in my head i got it confused with no woman no cry mm. but i remember just thinking she really for me killing me softly was her was her singing about bob marley i don't know how i got that into my head but for me i remember thinking she just really 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 loves this guy you know <laughs> the, the the emotion in it, it it's just it really connects you know yeah, well of course um, she and she actually ended up uh marrying uh bob marley's son yeah, and they did some work with him, didn't they? Did, didn't they do a version of "No Woman No Cry" with him? With him, that's Steve. Steve Marley, is it? Uh, well, I think they did that song with him, but it was I think it was his other son who she married, uh, Ro- Rowan Marley, I think perhaps okay. is his name. Um, I should know that. Sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, that that, that was a, a class. What did you think of their cover of "No Woman No Cry"? Absolutely brilliant, Dan. I mean, that brings me to what I'm going to. Uh, touch on as my my top three okay mm. <laughs> for me i've got to give no woman no cry my number one right yeah uh, my number one track in the album i kind of felt you know maybe i shouldn't go with no woman no cry because it was the fourth single um that was released over here but i don't think it was ever released as a single in the u.s i was thinking maybe i should just go for some of the the more hardcore tracks on the album but i kind of can't just get away from it as my number one i just love the lyrics i love the vocals um it's a great little story and um, of course it samples the it pays it's a homage to bob marley and right throughout mm. the record they're playing homage to different artists uh to enya of course once by act by sort of a, by, in a roundabout way to enya but they're paying homage to different artists that have influenced them and they pay homage to bob marley here and um, and it's a it, you know the original bob marley is a great great song as well and of course the interesting thing about that song dan is that the songwriting credit was given to a guy called vincent ford mm. uh who ran a soup kitchen in Trenchtown. Um, and was able to give the this the, the the soup kitchen. He was able to run the soup kitchen, um, f- you know, from the royalties for that song for many years. That's talking about the original Bob Marley song. Uh, but it gets my number one. It still, you know, it still connects today as it did thirty years ago. Uh, how about you, Dan? Well, do you, do you know what it, it, it ta- we we talked about this before when we were talking about Sinead O'Connor doing a cover of her famous Prince song, no, "Nothing Compares to You." And it's the same here with Killing Me Softly and No Woman, No Cry. It takes an incredible talent to cover a song, but make the song your own. And yeah. and um, to take a classic like No Woman, No Cry and um, bring it kind of up to date and make it resonate with a whole new generation of, of, of people what was quite the feat. And I remember at the time on the back of No Woman, No Cry being such um, a hit, there was a massive resurgence in Bob Marley's popularity uh, uh, across Ireland. And you had, uh, you know, um, teenagers going down the street wearing T-shirts with pictures of Bob Marley on it. And I always remember one one of my memories, this is close to your home, Paul. I remember visiting uh, um, Butlins or Mosney in, um, in Meath um, back in the day. And I, for some reason, this sticks out in my, in my head. I remember this uh, young fella, 
sitting amongst the wallsters, kind of just where there used to be this thing in Mosny you, you, you stood up on and it spun around and around oh, and yeah. around. And this guy was sitting there. A yellow, big yellow thing. A big yellow thing. And one yeah. thing, another thing I remember about Butlins or Mosny uh, was mm-hmm. as well, there was it was just always full of bees and wasps um, yeah. attracted by the candy <laughs> floss, right? But anyway, I'm kind of going a bit getting a bit sidetracked here, but um, we should do a special episode on 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 Mosny at some stage. But um, uh, the big Mosny show. But but <laughs> what, 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 the memory I have um, related to this is I remember this guy, a young fella. He was probably only about fifteen or sixteen. But I thought he was he was like a cool dude, um, a little bit older than me. Maybe it was you, Paul. But he was sitting and <laughs> he was sitting down on, on, on one of the park benches and he had this big, massive ghetto blaster on his knees and he was playing out uh, Bob Marley. And it just kind of it it, it, it it stands out to me as a kind of a memory of that time in terms of how uh, resurgent Bob Marley's music was. And it did absolute wonders for that shop in Stephen's Green on the third floor. You know, the one that sells the Bob Marley t-shirts. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, God. That that, that takes me back. My God. It it, it did wonders for it. I'd I'd fair play to them. They'd be delighted now. We might even get them to to sponsor the pod. Um, That'd be pretty good. Dan, for me, so do you want to give your, do you want to give us your number one or do you agree with me? No, woman, no, I, no, I, I think No Woman No Cry is definitely up there uh, as one of my um, number one, one of my top three anyway. Um, and I, I would have put Killing Me Softly in as well. I tell you, the, I'll give you the one we haven't mentioned uh, yet because we've talked about those two. So Ready or Not uh, Ready for or me, not. and I know, I know, um, You've quite a quite a bit of information on it, um. But the, the, what I what I love about it, um, initially, is you know when you you put it on first, particularly mm. if you're going down the road in the car or you're listening to your headphones, and I love the way that the music at the beginning kind of pans from uh, speaker to speaker like a searchlight, you know, and it and and it kind of brings you right into the scene of this kind of ready or not, here I come, um. It's it's just really well produced. There's the edge of danger in it, isn't there? Oh, there, there is. And of course, the video for it at the time was kind of like this action video with helicopters and a, a bit like you yeah. on your on your belly looking, you know, amongst the strawberries. In the video, the Fugees are on their belly, you know, going through <laughs> mud right. and water and all of this kind of stuff. Big, big, big budget, big budget production, and 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 really great video, and really great cover on this album as well. Love the album oh. cover, with, you know, the, with the three contemplative figures. So you know, this it's 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 very impactful. Um, Dan, my number two is going to go to uh, Ready or Not. Um, I had a little bit of t- been a, was going back and forth about where to go with it, but it, it gets my number two. It's 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 again. It's got that slightly lullaby kind of quality in it. Very melodic. Can you um, sing it for us, there, Paul? No, I won't be singing it for you. That that'll lose our listeners. <laughs> We're very. We want to keep you guys. Um, the, the one of the interesting things about this, Dan, is that our own Enya is involved in it. I mean, the album pays homage uh, to their influences, and um, and they, you know, there's. They, they wear their influences on 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 their sleeve, I suppose you might say, but they, they use an. an uh, a sample of an Enya song, um, but they use this without our permission. It's this. It's the track Bodicea. Um, I hope I have the pronunciation right. And um, it's it, there was a huge there was a controversy at the time. Enya threatened legal action. Uh, there was talk maybe that all the records would have to come off the shelves. But eventually, the whole thing was 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 you know uh, there was a deal was cut and everybody was satisfied. Uh, they paid a fee uh, to to sample it. They hadn't credited Enya uh, for the track, um, and of course, if you listen to Enya's track, you, you'll see you'll see why Enya was annoyed. Okay, because <laughs> it's it, they they lift it, um, but they made but uh, look amends were made and everybody was happy. But as part of the deal, I think it was the record company were supposed to put a sticker on at the front of every album to say. Enya was here, okay. So to say, uh, there's a track here that pays homage to Enya and samples her. Um, but I can confirm to Enya, right? And listen, shout out to Enya. How could we reach her? That the record company haven't made good on their sticker deal because I had to rebuy uh, my record and there's no sticker on it. And um, so stickers, ninety CDs. It's a bit of a theme here on the big album show because we covered previously the parental uh, advisory angle. 
Yeah, and I just think, uh, uh, you know, on that, it was it was funny that um, Enya, apparently she agreed to settle out of court when she found out that they weren't a, a gangster rap band because obviously at the time you had Tupac, you had Biggie and all that kind of stuff going on. And Enya wasn't the biggest fan of that whole, uh, you know, gangster culture. But um, she, 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 as you say, she made amends when she realized that the Fugees were um, all together a bit nicer. But just when you're talking about uh, stickers, right? Mm. Because we mentioned at the beginning that there was a little bit of kind of controversy around this band, a bit of moral panic. And um, one of the the best kind of panic, really. The best kind of panic. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. (laughs) Panic at the disco and all that. Exactly. If you're going to panic, make it moral. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's plenty of that nowadays. (laughs) (laughs) And we hopefully will cause a bit of it on Twitter ourselves before we finish the show. But um, I tell you, um, the, 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 one of the things about the, 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 the album, and of course, you know, with a lot of uh, hip hop music, there was an awful lot of bad language on the album, it's fair to say. Um, and, and that did raise a few eyebrows. Um, but of course, it's not just confined to that, uh, that genre. You have uh, punk music and uh, various different kinds of music with the same sort of language, but it did raise eyebrows at the time in Ireland. And there was other things that uh, raised eyebrows as well. If you read kind of Irish Times articles from that period uh, discussing the Fugees. Um, and yeah. so there was this kind of suggestion by various journalists, now not Irish Times journalists, but this suggestion is dealt with in the Irish Times and um, that some of the members of the Fugees didn't like white people, which was a, a scurrilous thing to say and something that was completely rejected um, by the band. Um, but because, um, you know, I think the music is defiant, resilient, strong, and of course the band are calling themselves Fugees, um, there was this kind of negative reaction against that. And, and, and the band, there was an attempt to pen, paint the band in, in a very bad light. Um, now they did bring some controversy on themselves as well. Um, so we talked before in, in previous shows about some tragedies that took place in um, concerts in Ireland uh, around this period. Um, and that year in 1996, um, a, a schoolgirl died at a Smashing Pumpkins um, gig um, and the Fugees were, were set to play in, um, in, in the point in the same venue um, later that year. And on the day the Fugees played, the tragedy was discussed in Dal Aaron, and later that night, the Fugees played and were heavily criticised in the media in Ireland at the time because they took part in things such as jumping off the stage oh, and yeah, crowd stage surfing, diving, yeah. stage diving, yeah. and yeah. it got so bad. I think it was talked uh, on on uh, about on Live Line, and it was spoken about on uh, right across the media, both broadsheet and tabloid um, and uh, the heat got so much that the point depot actually banned the group from ever playing there again <laughs> cancelled cancelled yeah so they were really trendsetters cancelled <laughs> yeah i mean it's a good job they, they didn't have the old twitter on the go it would have been things would have been even worse i mean i remember that dan i remember the controversy about it at the time and it was always that 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 the fujis did they just they, they, they also had a very, very loyal and committed following. I mean, as you say, the, the different era in terms of gigs, different era in terms of security. It, gigs were rougher, uh, people were pushed and they were pulled. There was a big crush at the front of that gig, if I remember correctly, Dan. Um, and I remember there was pictures of security pulling people. Nobody was seriously hurt. No, no one was seriously injured, but they, they were pulling uh, fans uh, you know, from this kind of crush at the top, uh, pulling them over the crash barriers. Um, and that was a, you know, things got a little bit, didn't, you know, you know, things got a little bit, uh, a bit out of hand in the Point Depot yeah. back in October 1996. Of course, 30 years on, where are they now? They Most of the people at that now would be maybe heading into their 50s. They're probably sitting down now. Maybe they're, they're they, they have moral panic themselves about other things. You're listening to The Big Album Show with Paul and Dan. Please remember to subscribe Hit like and remember to follow us on our social media platforms at The Big Album Show. You know, the, the Fuji's actually got back together for a short period um, That's that, right. that no one really talks about because I think they released one single and they did they did a few European, um, uh, you know, gigs as well. It was around 2004, 2005, I believe. But uh, sadly, 
it didn't work out and um you know it really didn't work out because praz his comment after the whole event he said uh, before i work with uh lauren again you will have a better chance of seeing osama bin laden and george butch in starbucks having a latte discussing foreign policies so um pretty uh, emphatic kind of uh, rejection of the idea they'll ever get back to together again i think we might see an oasis reunion before we see yeah, a well, fuji's well, reunion well well, well, well watch, well, thanks a latte for that anecdote dan but watch <laughs> that space on on oasis because they have formed a film production company together to complete our little top three right i'm going to just say that my top three goes number one to no woman or cry number two to ready or not and number three and this is offbeat but it's to the intro the first song of the album uh, red intro and um, it manages to name check most of the tracks that are to follow and it's narrated really well by raz baraka who's the current mayor of newark twice elected um, and it's really really there's this really really nice piano that's really good scene setter it's offbeat it's playful and it sounds like a group warming up it's just a really nice introduction and segues really nicely into that song. Second song in the album, How Many Mics, which is a little banger, to be honest. Oh, it is um, a little banger. Like the, like that car you used to have, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to cancel you off my own podcast. Um, go for it, Dan. What's your, what do you have? A, do, do you have a number three? I'm going to go for I'm going to go for the obvious one here. Look, I'm just going to go for a Fuji La. Um, really, really strong song. Yeah, really, really good kind of um I don't know what what what, what you'd call it, kind of a doo wop style uh um vocal. Um the yeah. rapping is fantastic and uh a, a great hit. As you said, I think it was the first single off the album um to hit the shelves. And uh, yeah, it just it it just kind of set the tone for the whole album. Um really, really strong stuff. Some weird there is some weird kind of segues throughout the album. Um, some of it has aged very well. Some of the segues are kind of a bit like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about that one. But 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 I think in general, like when when it comes to the music, it has completely stood the test of time. It sounds yeah. as fresh as ever. And you know, it, it, one of the cool things about the album is that although it sounds incredibly fresh and modern, it 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 sounds kind of um. It sounds raw at the same time. So yeah. it was recorded by the band um, in a basement, I believe. Um, they, they had re released one album before this. It wasn't uh, a, a major success. It was, a, it was called um, Blunted Unreality. Um, it was kind of a more traditional uh, rap, hip-hop album. It didn't have the same kind of mel melodic qualities. But um, fair play to the record company, stuck with the band and gave them the resources to get the score together. And uh, fair play to the record company, a, a sentence never ordered before. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> true. We're breaking new ground on this podcast. We're op <laughs> we're looking at things from an entirely new perspective. No, look, Dan, I agree with you. I mean, they had plenty of time to make the record, and that shows. Um, and it's it, you know it, it's quite con it's very considered. Um, it's you know I, there's I mean for me I'm you know there's a like I, I kind of I kind of think that that it's aged pretty pretty solidly uh, right throughout. Um, it's there's a track on it called Manifesto, which oh, yeah. is just really fantastic and just sucks you right in uh, to the world of the band. And the thing that they managed to create here um, is that it is like the soundtrack to the Fugees. It it has a it it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And from that point of view, it should be enjoyed as an album of tracks, not track by track. And I wave my finger in the air and the way people listen to some people listen to music now. Random tracks here, random tracks here. I got the Spotify, I got the YouTube out, I got all the different <laughs> things going. Listen to it as an album, beginning, middle, and end. And you can see the different things, the softness, the light, but then a soft track like Manifesto, which is hard, which is tough. And it's also got that spiritual thing going on all, all, all over. And you know, I, I sometimes I, I mean, I come from a di we come from a very different worlds, uh, you know, and, and sometimes you know what they're talking about is strangely unfamiliar, and mm -hmm. um, but they bring their world to bear, don't they, Dan? They make it real, they paint the picture, um, and you know, it's just a it's a powerful record. De de definitely. What would you give it out of ten? Well, I'm going to be honest, and I mean, so so I've given, um, I, 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 you know, it it. 
so here's what here's my hot take, right? I recognize its greatness, but it's not necessarily great for me, right? Because mm. it's not necessarily my style of music. I mean, I was at that age, time getting huge into the Britpop music, which you know has been massively important in and my Spice life. Spice Girls uh, wannabe was out as well. At that, that Spice period, Girls wannabe that mad into it. Abs that, that hit the number well yeah and and then they had the Spice Girls had the Christmas number one that year and um, so for me like I, I recognize its greatness I recognize its influence I really enjoyed it and um, I got a great buzz off it as I I love the kind of as I said the lullaby quality of a lot of it the, the melodies that slight edge of 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 danger um that's there <laughs> but it it's not necessarily my my buzz I'm I'm not necessarily on the on the hip hop train right spit uh, it out what 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 number I'm gonna go for seven I'm gonna seven. go for seven ah that's that's that, that, that's pretty pretty generous um no i i am going to give it a number eight because um like it really does stand out to me as one of the best albums of that period um it's one of those albums i i bought at the time i still listen to today um i i give it an eight rather than a nine because i'm gonna or, or a 10 because i save that for uh, the miseducation of Lauren Hill when we when we review that album because I just think that is a masterpiece. But uh, this was certainly um, a, a fantastic album and it really did shake things up. And go and go get it. Go listen to it. I mean, I, I it, you'll get it for six quid on the goal on this website and and give it a listen and get it into your hands, right? And and you know, get back into the joy of buying records, right? CDs, records, whatever way you look, because you know, you get. I'm opening up here. You can maybe even hear that. You know, you got it. It's 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 a great little record, great album, great cover, uh, lovely words by the band inside. Um, so strongly recommended, and they'll be delighted now to hear all together, Dan, that we've given it such a good rating here on the Big Album Show. We would like to thank everybody for listening to us and for your support on social media. And please, please, if you like us at all, even a little bit, please like and subscribe and spread the word. Yeah, it's it's really important that you subscribe because we yeah. want to make sure we get this podcast out to as many yeah. people as possible. Absolutely. And next week, or in two weeks' time, I should say, we're going to be listening to a very good, classic, Irish-made album. We're going to be listening to to the faithful departed by the cranberries do you remember that paul oh my god i cannot wait dan i yeah. cannot wait I, it's going to be fantastic listen to it with us guys have a listen to that record listen to it with us and let you know let us know what you think give us your hot takes and um, can't wait and listen thank you to everybody for getting us so high up onto the album uh, where are we down on the charts right now very very high we were on, a, on. In, in terms of uh music critic podcast we were up there at i think we were at number 32 or something wow. in ireland at one point wow. and what's even cooler in so in many ways is we've hit we were in the uk charts at one point we were in the australian charts at another wow. point and we were in the canadian charts at one point yes, so we have you. listeners you know all over the place thank you now. to our canadian listeners our aussie listeners thank you to everybody and thank you we really mean it uh, we really appreciate your support and um, and we or we'll uh, look forward to talking to you in two weeks' time when we drop our next podcast. But for now, please have a listen uh, to The Score by the Fugees. And please, if you like this podcast, you know what to do. See you later. You're listening to The Big Album Show with Paul Dillon and Dan O'Neill.